Amen. How many are glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. Give your neighbor a high five. Say, it's awesome to be here with you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It is so good to have you this morning. How many come ready to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Amen. Amen. Well, I'm telling you, I am excited about the word God has given me this morning. I believe that it's going to speak to your hearts like it spoke to mine. I am trusting God to do that. But I am just thrilled and honored. To, it's Sunday morning, and I always look forward to Sunday mornings, but there's just something special about this morning. And before we go any further, can I ask Northwoods family, will you give every visitor we have today a big hand and welcome to Northwoods Church? <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. As always, I just want to say thank you to our, our team of leaders that, that serve every Sunday morning, making people feel welcome, working outside, working in the, in the foyers. You guys are, are what makes the face of Northwoods. And I thank you guys for all that you do. And I am just honored this morning. A couple of quick announcements before we get started. Um, February the 1st at, 6, at 5 p.m., um, Brother Tim has, uh, is going to have a men's fellowship meal and Bible study starting once a month. Um, but this, we're going to do move different places, but starting in February, on February 1st at 5 p.m. Um, if you need to follow or want to ride, we're going to take the church van at five, and we'll probably leave here about 4.30. But we're going to go over to Brother Tim's house. Tim is in the sound booth if you don't know who Tim is. And uh, we're going to go over there, have a, have, a, have a meal, and then we're going to have a Bible study and some fellowship. And then we're going to come back here on Sunday morning and have an awesome time in the Lord. But it's something our men wanted to start doing. Um, and we're also going to try to do some planning to get our women's ministry and men's ministry together when it warms up a little bit and have just a big shindig and awesome time in the Lord. Uh, and then uh, also don't forget there's some, there's some um, signs up in the foyer. We have our core youth group annual uh, Vic, uh, Valentine's Day banquet coming up. They serve us last year. If you wasn't here last year, you missed the treat. These guys work extremely hard, and they serve you. They feed you. They, they entertain you. There's going to be some awesome entertainment. We're going to entertain ourselves from what I hear as well. So I'm excited about that. But please, make sure you register. Make sure you, you support our, our core youth group. These guys are working hard, and they are reaching the community fast. And I'm thankful for that. Also, I want to brag on Lit Kids. Amen. For those of you that don't know, Lit Kids has moved over to the gray room officially and um, Pastor Jason, Pastor Nikki come in the other day and said we're probably going to start decorating a little bit. Is that okay? I said yeah, take it. Do what you're going to do. And I was walking through this morning and turned the lights on and at 7.30 and I walked in that room and I was like just wow. You guys did an awesome job. And lit kids, y'all go back there and rock the house out today. Worship and serve the Lord. Uh, keep reaching people. Keep reaching hearts, souls, and minds. But um, Yes, also, this coming weekend, uh, Friday night and Saturday, um, there is a Big Dreams conference, or Big Dreams in a Small Town conference at Family Worship Center in Cairo, Georgia. Pastor Johnny Moore, who is our district overseer, um, always sends us a special invitation. Um, it is an awesome experience. It is, from what I understand, it's still free, right? It's still free right now uh, up to the 20th. I think the 20th is tomorrow. So if you can go register, all you do is go to uh, www.fwc.tv, and you can find um, Big Dreams in a Small Town. Click on it. It's free to register. They will take up a love offering there if you can just give a dollar or two to help that conference continue. This is, I think, their 26th or 27th year doing it. Um, but they have, they have moved from a small little community church and become an over 700-plus member church that they are today, and they are a community-oriented church. They reach out. They love those that are broken, and they make people see who they are in the Lord. They, they help people find their identity, and I want us to take as many people over there as we can and um, have a good time of fellowship. They're going to have some, also some other speakers coming in um, that, that have had very, very good success in ministry and reaching out to communities and teaching us how to take the church outside of these four walls because it's great when you can have church in here, and we need that. But it's no good if we don't know how to take what's in here out there. Amen? So we, that's what we want to do is go out into the highways and the byways and compel people into the house of the Lord. Amen? So I think that's all we're going to share this morning on announcements, and we're going to jump straight into worship. How many is ready to worship our Savior? Amen. Hallelujah. Will you stand all over the house this morning? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Will you just lift your hands to heaven and, and just agree with me this morning? The Bible says that if any two 
should agree is touching one thing, that whatsoever they ask, it shall be done. Whatsoever they ask of him, it shall be given unto them. And I don't know what you came in here in need of this morning, but I'm agreeing with you that God will touch you where you are. He will bless you. If you need deliverance, he will deliver you. If you need healing, he will heal you. He will break the chains of bondage if you need them broken this morning. God loves you, and he is here right now to sit in your presence, to stir in your spirit, to stir up that gift of God that was given to you. Just allow him to work in you this morning. Father God, we thank you for another wonderful day that we have to worship you in spirit and in truth. God, I'm asking you this morning that you would take every burden that has been brought into this house on the shoulders of men and women. God, and that you would lift that burden and you would give them a peace that passes all understanding. I pray, oh God, that you would just touch them from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. That you would remind them that your, your book declares yes. that we are the apple of your eye. That we were blessed to be a blessing, oh God, oh God. That we were fearfully and wonderfully made in your image. So right now, God, we lift unto you all of the praise, all of the honor, and all of the glory for what you've done, what you are doing, and what you are about to do in the name of Jesus. We thank you for it, Lord, and we honor you in worship this morning. In Jesus' name, and everybody says, amen. God bless you. Let's worship this morning. We're going to tell the devil not today.
just want to thank you already for what you're doing in this house. God, as we begin to worship, I just, my, my spirit was just leaping. One for our whole praise team, but, and she's going to kill me, but I'm going to do it anyways because that's okay because I'm not Ashley. I'm pastor right now. Pastor Ashley, she likes to call me that, so I'm going to tell her that, so I'm going to talk to her right now. But the fear can be so crippling at times where you don't feel good enough, you don't feel worthy enough, you don't think your voice is strong enough. But I just felt the heavens open and the pits of hell shake because of obedience. And I just seen when she came out here doing like this, and that's what I wanna challenge you today is to do like this because there's something about overcoming when you lift your hands to our Father in the midst of everything that you're going through, in the midst of everything that you're facing, there's something about the name of Jesus. Even when you don't understand it, even when you're tired, even when you're frustrated, when you're broken and you don't know where help is coming tomorrow, oh my God, but in His presence, in the name of Jesus, in that surrender position, and I want you to do it. I know it's uncomfortable, but I do. I want you right now, not because I ask you, but I want in your heart the obedience. Just lift your hands in this moment to Him. God, we surrender it to you this morning. We surrender every weight. We came this morning even when we didn't feel like it. We came this morning even when our homes were broken. We came this morning even when we didn't have it all together because we didn't come to glorify ourselves, but we came to glorify you. And you are unchanging. You are consistent. In the middle of it all, you are still God. You are still God. And in John 16, you said, I tell you the truth. You will weep and you will mourn over what is going to happen to me. But the world will rejoice. But you will grieve. But your grief will suddenly turn into wonderful joy. I'm here to tell you there's a suddenly that has taken place in the heavenly realm. There is a suddenly because there's something about the name of Jesus that suddenly the demons begin to tremble. When you quit looking at what you're going through with the magnifying glass and you shift it to look at our Father through the magnifying glass, He is exalted and your problems will start to diminish. I'm not going to tell you that they won't still be there. But my God, that fear that once gripped you, it won't be there no longer. And I asked Candy to hold on to her mic because I, before we take up the offering, I want them to go back into that. I want you to hear what stood down death, his love, his love for you, his love for me. So I'm declaring right now that as she opens up her mouth, that the heavens would part and that, that just holy presence of our Father will just come down and rest in this house. Because fear is a liar. Do you hear me? Fear is a liar and it has to go in the name of Jesus. I declare this morning that it has to go in the name of Jesus. I declare freedom in this house. I declare liberty in this house. I declare joy. Joy. Unspeakable joy. Have your way, Father. Hallelujah. Have your way, Father. Yes. Move right now, right now. Worship with them. Love stood down dead. Crush the dead.
ministers to come right now at this time. And I want you to continue worshiping. Yeah, Pastor, and I'm not going to give you a break because I like it when there's <laughs> music going. Because we're getting ready to give. We're getting ready to just give back to him. Again, this is for the building and the glory of his kingdom. And we are letting the devil know not today in any area of our life. Not in our finances, not in our homes, not in our churches, not in our nations, not in this community. Oh, Lord, just have your way in this place. There's a sweet freedom spirit in here. It's such a sweet spirit. And let me tell you something. You can worship in freedom when you're broken. Oh, my God, there's a something about a sweeter incense to our Heavenly Father when you worship in your brokenness. So we're going to worship our Father right now. If you would like to give this morning, you can give, not just by your offering, but you can go online and give through Givelify. You can go online through Facebook and give. But I want you to give intentionally this morning. I want you to sow a seed. And when you sow that seed, I don't care if it's a dime, a nickel, or a penny. When you say it, you declare multiplication over every area in your life, over every area in, the, in this church. I declare that Northwoods, it ain't just about Northwoods, but there is about building the kingdom of God. And I thank you for the body of believers he has brought here for such a time as this. So, Lord, I thank you as your children get ready, as they're preparing their offering, and we prepare it to give back to you. Give us wisdom on how to use it this year. Give us wisdom on what we need to build and when we need to build it, when we need to go out. And, Lord, I declare that these doors will be open to the lost and to the broken, but I thank you that they will not leave out of here the same way that they came in. So, Lord, we stand here today. Reminding the devil, not today, not tomorrow, not ever again. Because we're going to sing praises and we're going to give from an overflow. Because when we give from an overflow, my God, my God, you can continue pouring into that overflow. So, Lord, we just thank you. Have your way and touch your children as they bring forth what they have. Lord, we declare these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Y'all come forward and love on one another. Let everybody know you're glad you're here.
Jesus' name above every other name. Yes, hallelujah. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, yes. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Yes, we do. said in John 1, 1, that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Yes, sir. And the Word, Lord, it is enough. Your Word became flesh, Lord God, and dwelt among us. Your Word, Lord God, took on the temptations of this world without failing. Your Word, Father, is a firm foundation it teaches us your love it teaches us God your righteousness it teaches us that 
we are not good in who we are but Father when we turn our lives over to you we are purified not by our works and not by our power not by our might but by your spirit your comforter leads and guides us into all truth so Lord we invite your Holy Spirit into each and every house represented in this building today we are your temple Lord God the temple of your Holy Spirit dwell among us dwell within us overflow God let our bellies today Lord burst with rivers of living water Lord let us not walk by a thirsty person without giving them drink let us not walk by a hungry person without giving them food let the spirit of God that lives in us reach out and quench the thirst quench the hunger right now father we speak to anxiety and we tell it to go we speak to fear and we tell it to leave we speak to depression and we tell it to release and to be gone And right now, we speak to boldness, Lord. Just as in Acts chapter 4, they prayed with boldness, for for boldness, God. And the Bible says that they were baptized with the Holy Ghost, and they spake with boldness, Father. God, we speak that there come a faith out of this house this morning that passeth anything we've ever known or done. Lord, let the faith, let that now faith arise, God. Because when that now faith arises, God arises in our lives. And when God arises in our life, our enemies are scattered. They might come in one way, but they'll flee seven, Lord. I thank you right now, Holy Spirit, that you are speaking to your people. You are comforting their hearts and their minds. You are giving them guidance, Lord. You are showing them one step at a time. Lord, we may not be able to see the end of the journey. And Lord, I believe that is a blessing because we'll oftentimes when we know the vision, we'll try to skip the process. But God, it's the process that we're going to grow in, that we're going to learn in. And Lord, we can't lose hope in the, in the process because just as you did in the children of Israel in the wilderness, God, their shoes never wore out and their clothes never, they never grew out of their clothes because God, if part of the process means you're there with us. And every step we're taking, the word says that every good man's steps are ordered by the Lord. Every step, God, one step at a time. Light one step at a time. And we're going to walk in faith knowing that the next step is already provided. The next step has already been thought out by our Heavenly Father. Lord, I ask you to guide us and guide me in this word this morning. Let me decrease that you might increase. Let no one look to me as though I'm going to be their help or their saving grace. Because, Lord, I am nobody. But, Father, when they, as I speak this morning, let them hear your voice. Let me be obedient to your word where it says to let your work shine before men. That they might see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. I pray, God, that they turn their attention to you right now. Their, your word, your holiness, your righteousness. Because you are the only way. You are the truth. You are the way of life. I pray, God, you anoint every ear to hear, every mind to understand, every heart to receive what you are speaking to your people. Let everyone that has an ear hear the voice of the Lord this morning. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Will you turn to about two or three people and say, God has got you where you are on purpose for where you go. Amen. Brother Timothy, can you give me a little bit of light? There you go. Y'all are a good looking crowd. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's give our lit kids a big hand as they are heading out to 
go have church in the back. I'm believing for a great awakening, a revival to happen in our young people. I'm reading a book right now by Ken Ham, and it's really got a lot of revelation to where we are in the world. And you know, a lot of times we, we get stuck in wanting to do it the way we, it's always been done. And we like to go back to the book of Acts chapter 2 and look how Peter preached. But something that I've discovered is when you look at Acts chapter 2 and you look at the sermon that Peter preached, you also got to look at sermons uh, or Peter's uh, congregation. Peter had a, had a congregation of Jews, people that were already there for sacrifices. They already knew uh, the genesis of life. They already knew what had happened in, in the very beginning. They already knew the, when someone used the word sin, they, they didn't have to ask what is sin. They, they already knew. They had studied the scrolls. They had studied the scriptures. They had been in the temples, and they had year after year after year brought sacrifices to the temple. So when Peter preached, he didn't so much focus on the foundation of why you needed saving. But what I love is a lot of times when we look to that, we always go to Acts chapter 2. But if you'll go to Acts chapter 17, I believe you'll see where America is at today. We are a divided nation. We are divided between, amen, an older generation and a millennial generation. We are divided between what used to work and what's not working or what people are trying to do. And we don't know, is this the devil that's trying to trying to change the, the word? Is this the devil trying to change what we do? Or is this the enemy trying to creep in and make us become deceived and believe a lie? But see, when Paul preached his sermon in Acts chapter 17, he didn't preach it like Peter did in Acts chapter 2 because Paul wasn't preaching to a Jewish culture who knew the word, who knew that they were expecting a Messiah. Though many of them didn't accept Christ as the Messiah, they knew the word declared one would come. But Paul was preaching to a, to a room full of Greeks, people that didn't know the word didn't know the foundation they didn't know whether the earth was millions of years old or whether did it start in Genesis 1 1 they didn't know if if dinosaurs were here of dinosaurs were here. they didn't know if 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 you preached to about word sin what is sin I try to be a good person and and I, there's some statistics and I'll start I'm gonna bring I'm putting something together now to bring those to you but I want to bring something to light before I jump into my sermon this morning is we have to recognize when division comes and its avenues. Division is not always going to come and blatantly show itself as division. It's not going to come and say, I'm here to divide. I'm not here to tear you apart. I'm here to change everything you do. The Word of God declares that the Word of God never changes. God never changes. But all throughout from Genesis to Revelation, depending on the congregation of people, his approach to people was different. Whether it was through Peter to Jews or through Paul to Greeks. Whether it was through uh, Billy Graham to people in Australia or modern day preachers today to an American culture that is so different than it was in the 1950s. We are living in a time where we have to understand that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. And we have to be willing to stand and see the truth for what it is. Declare the word of God as the word of God. Don't, don't let doubt rest in your mind yet you're trying to deliver truth to someone else. You have to be assured on who you trust and who you believe. Amen. But that's enough for my soapbox today. If you have your Bibles this morning, and you uh, will, if you'll stand for the reading of God's Word, but will you turn with me to the book of 2 Kings, chapter 7, verse 1 through 9. When you find it, say amen. When you, when you, if you're still looking for it, say hold up. That's what I like. Some response. To, we got some response in the church today. I said... The book of 2 Kings, chapter 7, verse 1 through 9. If you don't have a Bible with you today, if you don't have an iPad, an iPhone, an iTab, or whatever you got, your eyeglasses, just look to the um, wall. We'll have it there for you as well. But I do encourage you, always carry your word. Technology fails, but the word don't. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. 2 Kings, chapter 7, verse 1 through 9. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Then a Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God. In other words, the king's right hand man said to Elisha, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven might this thing be? 
he doubted it. And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not eat thereof. In other words, Elisha said, You done messed up now. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate. And they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live, and if they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses, and their asses, and even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink, and carried thence silver and gold and raiment, and went and hid it, and came again and entered into another tent, and carried thence also, and went and hid it. Then they said one to another, We do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come, that we may go and tell the king's household. Stretch your hands this way. Pray for me as I pray for you. Father God, we thank you this morning for your many blessings. We thank you, Lord, that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, Lord God. I pray for your strength and your ability this morning, God, to just allow me to be your conduit this morning. Use me as your vessel, Father, and speak to your people. I pray, oh God, that you, your anointing would flow, that you would destroy yokes, that you would reach the lost, that you would restore the broken, Father, and that you would mend anything, God, that has been torn apart. And I ask you in the name of Jesus to just have your divine way over any other way. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. Before you're seated, will you look at your neighbor and say, I refuse to die right here. Amen. I refuse to die right here. I have about four or five pages of notes that I've been working on with me this morning. And I just heard some of you just like, oh gosh, oh me. This man can't get past a page of notes on a Sunday morning in less than two hours, and he's got four or five. The good news to that is I've broken this up into a two-part sermon, so I'm going to give you a little bit today, and then there's going to be a to-be-continued to come across the bottom of the screen, and then you've got to come back next week to get the second half. Amen. Amen. No, these are, it's the same text, but two different sermons, so I do invite you back to here next week, but you are going to get the entirety of the sermon that I have for you this morning. It is not my intention to use all of these notes today, so um, I just couldn't stop when God had me going. But I want to talk to you on the, on the subject, I refuse to die right here. These leprous men are sitting at the gate of the city or, of Samaria. They, they are outcasts. They're leprous men. Leprous men were outcasts from their society. They were not allowed in the city. They were, a, they were shunned by the general population of people. They were a curse. They were looked down upon. They were separated from the people of Israel. Under the law of Moses, lepers were considered unclean, and they were required to live outside of the main camp until they were declared clean by the high priest. But the bad news for these four lepers is there was no temple in Samaria. There was no, there was no high priest to cleanse them. These men were stuck in a cursed state of mind. These people were stuck in, in a bad situation. Have you ever felt like you have been stuck in a bad situation and the only thing you thought could help you was so far away you had no hope in sight? Under the law of Moses, God had also prescribed a healing process for lepers that after so many days you could go to the temple and the high priest would come and he would examine you and he would look at you and he would declare whether you were going to be deemed clean or remain unclean. And then whatever he would say would, would put you either back in the game or back in the outside the gate. 
These four were truly helpless and hopeless. As lepers, they would have been stoned to death if they tried to enter the city by force. Because they were unclean. They knew the law. They knew what was their destiny. So they said, if we go into the city, we'll die of famine if we don't die at the hands of the leaders. There's really no hope there, but are we really going to just sit right here and die? But if we go and don't do anything, we're going to die. But if we go to the Syrians, they might kill us. They, they might look at us and say, yep, you guys are about to die. And they may kill us on sight. But that is the only place we have hope that they might at least let us come into their place, let us, let us eat, let us drink, and maybe be slaves in their presence or something. They were helpless and hopeless. They could not even go to the temple because in the city of Samaria, there was no temple of the Lord, and there was no high priest to go for the healing that might have been received. See, in the Bible, leprosy is a type that is also a representation of sin. So before we can look back in the Old Testament and say, oh, those leprous men, man, how disgusting they were, how awful they were, how nasty they were, Look at your neighbor and say, you were once a leper too. And I'm not, I didn't say a leopard. Some of you are like, that's my spirit animal. I'm a leopard. <laughs> and say he was a leopard. You went there, yeah. <laughs> you were a leper. Skin bulls. Nastiness, filthiness. Even when you try to be righteous, yet you appear so filthy. Because our righteousness are as filthy rags, says the word. Amen? But leprosy is a type that represents sin. And it works the same way that sin works. This is, this is something good for you to ponder on. Leprosy would start on the inside of a man. In the very early stages of leprosy, you may not be able to walk past someone and know that they have leprosy. It would start on the inside. But the longer that leprosy stayed, the longer that leprosy was allowed to remain, the longer that leprosy went untreated, and in those days, there was no treatment. You just get outside until hopefully the Lord either heals you or kills you, but you just ain't coming in until it's gone. Today, we've got medicine. We've got modern-day medicine. We've got things that help us when we go through processes like that. And I don't know how many of you study our, our teenage era, era in Thomas County, but mamas and daddies, you better get on your children because Thomas County is one of the leading counties for, for sexually transmitted diseases in the state of Georgia. I just want to go and throw that to my youth over here on the side. Hallelujah. I want to throw that to my single men and women out here in the crowd. You better be careful because what's on the inside may not appear on the outside, but when you end up in the doctor because something's going wrong, you might realize, I done linked up with something that I shouldn't have never had. Amen. God didn't, he didn't put orders and rules and commandments in place for us to just talk about them. Amen. They're there because there's a purpose and a reason. God don't speak because he well, likes to hear himself speak. That's why I'm careful about people that hear the Lord I mean, I read Abraham, who was accounted unto him as righteous. He was considered God's friend, and yet there's only a handful of times in Abraham's life you hear God actually audibly speak to him and actually give him the word. But I hear some people, all the, they, every two hours of the day, God says something. I'm like, God, Lord, God just talks to you. Ain't nobody, ain't a prophet in the Bible talks, got to talk to God like you. But anyway, that's good stuff. And I believe that a lot of times when people say that, it's what God's speaking to their spirit. He's not actually speaking prophetically or uh, you know, Abraham, from your seed, there's going to be many nations that are going to be blessed. And I believe it's a different understanding, but I do think that we could be careful with our terminology when we say stuff like that. That we are, make sure that it is understood that God is speaking to our spirit, man, that he has just given us the sense of comfort through his Holy Spirit that we hear those things or see those things. But anyway, back to leprosy being a type of sin. It starts on the inside and it works its way to the outside. See, the same thing happens with sin. The Bible said we were born in the sin and we were shaped in iniquity. In other words, you, whether you liked it or not, when you was born, you contracted a disease before you ever took your first breath. And that disease was called sin. It was a spiritual disease. In other words, I don't care how much baby you are, I don't care how little you are, you were born and now God doesn't account unto you if you get aborted or you pass away from your mother's womb, you're, you're not going to go to hell because you didn't have a chance to, 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 to go and make things right. But the Bible says we were born in sin. We were shaping iniquity. 
when you, have, when you go to the age where you have a responsibility, you understand right from wrong, God expects you to do right. Because the Bible says to him that knows to do right and do it that not, it is sin. So in other words, stop telling your children that God starts hearing you after 12 years old. Because Josiah was only six, amen, he was the king of Israel. Hallelujah. Other people, God can touch a three-year-old and give him understanding and wisdom and knowledge above his age in life. You've got to quit telling people that this is the area, this is the limit. And you've got to start worshiping God and going back to the foundations of truth. If God wants a six-month-old to stand up and preach the word, if he can make a rock cry out in your place, I promise you he can make a six-year-old understand or a six-month-old or whatever. What I'm getting at is stop putting the limits. Stop trying to, put, trying, to, trying to make everybody understand when you haven't understood yourself. Because someone that would say that has absolutely no understanding. Sin works its way to the surface. When, as we grow up and the longer we let sin go untreated, the more it begins to reveal itself on the outside. I remember, I'm going to be a little transparent with you this morning, but I remember when I first got saved, I hadn't been long, what, a year and a half back from Afghanistan. I had so much hate, so much bitterness in my life. I, was, I, I hated myself because when I came home from Afghanistan, my wife, had, when, she, when I left, she was four months pregnant. When I came home, we had a seven-month-old son. She had learned to be a parent and learn how to live life for seven months without me there. And I had learned to only live with anxiety every single day of my life. I had learned to live among men and, and, and nastiness and filth and you, men, you know what I'm talking about. Y'all got man caves. You can't, a woman can't walk in a man cave without knowing a man. You're going to smell it when you walk in there. Because it's, it's like a competition goes on when you start eating, eating hot wings and watching the game. Somebody's like, yep, yeah, I'm going to beat that one in a few minutes. And next thing you know, you just, you, 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 my wife's really mean, so let me give on. All right. So the thing is, I came back, though, and I was really dealing with stuff. But I gave my heart to God, and, man, he was just moving miraculously in my life. I was like, just like, man, it was just like that. Everybody's like, it's not going to be easy. They, they, they didn't get it like I got it because, I mean, I was pumped up. I, I walked in Walmart, and I was talking to the cashier about God. I, I, I went back there. I, I caught myself one day in belt talking to a mannequin trying to lead him to Christ. He just wouldn't respond. I, it's just, I was so hyped up in the Lord that nothing could affect me. I wasn't worried about fear. And then one day God said, all right, time to come down off of your false cloud. I've given, I've given, I've carried you. Now I'm going to put you back on your feet. It's time to walk. Time to learn to walk in your spirit now. Stop being carried in your spirit. Time to walk in your spirit. And there's 40 and 50 year Christians that still haven't learned to walk in their in the spirit. They've learned to be carried. They 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 search their whole lives for a high in God. I just gotta feel those bumps. I gotta feel that wind on my neck. I got listen, that stuff's real. I felt that I've been there, but there's times in my life when God leads me to a cave and he says, Go out there and look at the hurricane. I wasn't in it. Go out there and look at the fire. I wasn't in it. Listen to the still small voice. Here I am. Sometimes you gotta quit looking for the big picture of God and just look at the little thing God wants you to know right now. Because the little thing God wants you to know right now, when you get your hands on that little thing, that, that little handful of meal and that little cruise of oil or that little cup of fish and that little piece of bread, God's going to multiply it and make what was little into something big when all along you were wanting to just see him in the big. You want to go to the crusade and get that word from God. My God, you carry a word if you'll go buy one right now. You go down to downtown. There's a Christian bookstore. They sell Bibles every day. Go get your word. Stop waiting on the crusade. Stop waiting on a new Billy Graham to come up. Stop waiting on people to, to make you who you are in God. And let God make you. He's the one that created you anyway. Let him make you into who you're supposed to be. Don't, let, don't come to Josh Toomey and think that because I got some paper on the wall back there that tells me I'm ordained, that I got the ability to make you in your, put you in your identity. I didn't dress a single one of you to come to church this morning, but you're here. What was that? I don't know where, where that was going. I'm just going to come over here for a little while. What I'm getting at is, you're here, and I didn't come and dress you. In other words, you didn't say, well, man, I'm supposed to get up and live today. I'm supposed to be at church today, but I need a man to, or a woman to come and make me who I am. You got up, and you made a, a, a choice and a decision to get up, put your clothes on, get in the car, and get to where you are right now. 
The same thing has to happen in your spiritual walk with God. you got to get up and make a choice to crucify your flesh every single day. Just like you put your clothes on every day and nobody's right. you got to get up and put on the armor of God. you got to get up and you got to spend some time with the Lord. you got to talk to the Lord. And not only when you talk, don't just talk to the Lord. Part of talking in a conversation is shutting up too. He gave you two ears and one mouth, which means you ought to listen twice as much as you speak. Amen. You ought to talk to God, pour it out, whatever you're going to say, cry, if, whatever. Tell God how mad you are. You, you, you think, oh, it's going to be unholy. My wife was sharing this the other day with somebody. You think you're unholy because you're truthful with God and how mad and angry you are. If you don't get that stuff out of the inside of you, it's going to start coming out on the outside. Before I went on my rabbit trail, that's where I was getting at is, I got on this high cloud with God, and I went, I started ministering, and me and my wife went to Red Lobster one night. Yeah, we get to save up all year long, and we'll go to Red Lobster once a year. But no, we went, all we had was Jaden at the time. We had just started, we had just stepped into being a, becoming youth pastors. We're sitting at Red Lobster, almost the empty restaurant. There's one man sitting in there, and they, they took us and sat him right behind him. He was drinking champagne or wine or whatever he had, and he was eating his meal very quietly. And we went in, and Jaden is a little baby at the time. He's old enough to kind of stand up in the booth, you know, kind of old, kind of young enough to still get on your nerves, but old enough to stand up and get on your nerves even more. And he got there whining and crying about something. And I was getting frustrated. The waitress was trying to take our order. So out of respect for the man behind me, I didn't want that man sitting there having to listen to my I was going to get up and take my young into the bathroom and give him a reason to cry. So I told the waitress, though, she come and said, I said, ma'am, I said, I'll be right back. I'm going to take my, my, my son to the bathroom. I said, he's wanting to act like a brat. I'm this baby's daddy. I can tell you what I want to say. When I went to get up and walk around, walk out, this elderly man in the seat behind me says, yes, he is. That cloud sank real fast. <laughs> and I, walked, I took about two steps. And I'll tell you, God, he tried to grab me. Because I, I did. I took two steps and knew I just need to shut up. And I couldn't do it. My flesh said, you ain't going to let this man get away with that, are you? So I didn't. I turned around and I went back and I set my baby down. And me and him had a pretty dealt out conversation. And he called me trailer trash and he took out the go plate and he left. And we had a whole restaurant to ourselves after that. Tell me that the God won't use the enemy to bless you. <laughs> Amen. But I had more conviction than I had ever had in my life after that. Because I did, I didn't, I, I spoke in tongues, but it wasn't holy one. I spoke, I spoke a, another language, and it wasn't heavenly. And I remember me and my wife went to my pastor and told him what we had done and what happened. And first thing he told me, he said, that's your, that's your son, that was your daddy coming out in you. He said, so don't beat yourself up for being a daddy. He said, but yes, the things you, the way you was, the way you let it take you, yes, that's what you're going to have to get under control. But what I didn't realize is that hate and that bitterness and that, that little gasoline ball was still living on the inside of me. And I didn't know it. But somebody found a way to get to it with a spark, and it caused me to blow up. And it caused me to get out of my character. And it caused me, what if, and I, all I could think about now is what if my, what if the youth members in my class would have been sitting in the room that day? Would I have ever been able to talk to them about Christ again? Would I have ever been able to told them, tell them the Bible says love your neighbors, you love yourself? Would I have ever been able to tell them honestly and say, look, you got, you're doing some things wrong in your life and God wants to work in you? They would have probably looked at me and said, you're a hypocrite. You know that? I've seen you act. That's why the Bible tells us we need to guard our testimony. We need to guard our mouths. We need to guard our ears. We need to guard our lives because in a moment of frustration, in a moment of leprosy, in a moment of, of, of hiding things down on the inside, that bitterness, that anger, that frustration that you're not willing to get out, that you're not willing to let God have, it's going to begin to show on the outside. And you're going to find yourself on the outside of the city walls, on the outside of the gate, at the hands of, of lepers, leopards, at the hands of lions, at the hands of bears, because you have allowed what was on the inside of you to instead of being treated you have allowed it to curse your flesh and appear on your outside so leprosy I just want to give you an understanding of what these men, men look like in the flesh you say well brother Josh I'm going to need some scripture how can you consider us the same as lepers back then well I just gave you a biblical understanding of what lepers were the mosaic law what it said 
about lepers and how they go in, how they are to be cleansed. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. Put it on the wall for me. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. In other words, you were separated from God's kingdom and God's city. You were separated. He made all these covenant promises with Abraham, and you wasn't part of the plan. You wasn't in it. You was nowhere. You're, not, you're a Gentile. You're a nobody. You, you can't be in there. You, you can't do it. Every person in this room, you are Gentile. You had no part purpose without the blood of Jesus Christ. You can't have it. You can't get there. I, I don't care if you wasn't a Gentile. If you was a Jew, you can't get there without Jesus Christ. You can't get there. There's only one way to the Father, and His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. It is what He done on Calvary's cross. And, in the, and, and Paul told the church at Ephesus, he said, you were at one time without Christ. And because you were without Christ, you were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers. Israel is the church of Christ today. It is, the, it is who we are. We are the spiritual Israel. Amen. And we were without Christ. We were without Israel. We were without, without being a part of that. And we were outside of the city gates. So I want to take you now to the scene of this scripture. Samaria was the capital city of the northern kingdom of Israel. It was a city founded in opposition to the will of God. Jerusalem was the authorized city of God for his people. Jerusalem was Zion, the hill of God's holiness. Jerusalem was the official seat of human government of God's people. Jerusalem was the place where God put his name and where he dwelt in the temple. The very presence of God abided among his people from the Holy of Holies in the temple built by Solomon. But because God loves all of his people, because God sees us where we are, we might not be in Israel. We might not be in Jerusalem. Maybe I was cursed and born into this land. Maybe I was born into poverty. Maybe I was born into a broken home. Maybe I was born into bitterness. Maybe I was born into separation. Maybe from the moment that I took my first breath, my mama hated me. Maybe from the moment that I took my first breath, daddy never was around. I was born into this. But what God is showing us through this story is it don't matter where you was born, where, when you get born again, you're no longer where you used to be. You no longer are who you used to be God loves his people and through this story we see his hand at work on behalf of the people of Samaria this outlaw city of an outlaw government was under siege by Benadad the, the, the Syrian king the city was surrounded on every side by their enemies they were cut off from the outside there was no food getting in the people couldn't just go out and do what they were going to do these city gates were guarded. They were, they were protected. And the people were in famine in Samaria. Our cities today are under a worse kind of siege than what Benadad done to Syria. They are under attack by a far more deadly enemy. They have been invaded and surrounded by those whose only desire is to steal, to kill, and to destroy what God has tried to build. We see violence in the streets. We see gangs roaming around doing murder and committing mayhem on whosoever they encounter for some initiation or because it's cool. You've got gangs fighting and jumping people and beating people. Go to Atlanta right now, one of the most gang popular cities in America today. And these people will walk up to you and shoot you on a street corner just to wear a bandana in their pocket. You've got corruption in the highest levels of government who have no idea what the commonwealth of a man is. They have no idea what the, we the people have need of. They're focused on an on a, on a, on a accomplishment. They want to change everything that is righteous. <coughs> in, the book of, uh, in the book of Isaiah, he said, Woe unto them who call good evil and evil good. Woe unto them who take bitterness, who cast out the sweetness and take bitterness. Woe unto them who choose evil over good and call it opposite. The Bible says that in the last days men would call good evil and evil good. And we are living in that day. If you've never believed we were in the last days, you ought to look, turn on your TV for 10 minutes and tell me that we're not living closer now than we ever have. We see corruption from the highest level of governments to the lowest functionaries on the payroll. We see corruption in police forces that are sworn to protect and to serve. If we open our eyes and pay attention, we see the siege affecting those who are poor, disenfranchised, pushing them out as though they have no purpose to live. 
Every, we, we see on the, every day, we try to teach our kids right, but all they got to do is turn on a television or t- pull up a YouTube account, and there's filthiness. There, there's, I don't know how many of you have ever heard of HBO. I call it Hell's Box Office because it's the filth, the nastiest, filthiest things that come across there. You can't even turn on Cartoon Network for the kids. It's filth. You can't even give them a simple SpongeBob movie without them having some hidden, nasty points of messages hidden in them. <clears throat> the enemy is out to steal, kill, and to destroy. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. In the sage at Samaria, the Lord sent his prophet with the word of hope and deliverance. We look back at 2 Kings chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. There's a prophet by the name of Elisha. He's there, and he's giving them the word. They've been in a famine. They've been praying. They've been hoping. They've been just, we need something. And they had, got, they had been hoping all along, and then... They became hopeless. And right at the moment of becoming hopeless, God sends the prophet. And the prophet told him, he said, by this time tomorrow. See, there's a difference when the the enemy says that. Because there's another lady in the Bible who uses that same phrase. By this time tomorrow. You know who she was talking to? The same one that anointed Elijah. Elijah. It was Elijah. After he had done done overcome, his God had done overcome the prophets of Baal. And they were thrown down and slain. Jezebel said, by this time tomorrow, he will be like them. Same will be done to him. He runs off. He gets under a tree. He gets all suicidal, and then he ends up in a cave. God tells him, get your, get, get your head straight. I ain't done with you yet. There's 7,500 people that ain't knelt there need a bell. Get up off your little whiny soapbox and get down there and anoint some folks. And he goes down there and anoints. He throws a man on Elisha. We know the whole story. I'm not going to go in that. Now you have Elisha standing. He said, by this time tomorrow, he said that tomorrow about this time shall a measure of flying fire be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. In other words, by this time tomorrow, corn and flour and barley, it ain't going to be a rare entity. It's going to be sold for regular prices. It's going to be normal. By this time tomorrow. We've been in famine all this time. And you telling me by this time tomorrow, can, what would have happened when gas was, all, was $4 a gallon around Georgia? What would have happened if someone would have come to you and said, by this time tomorrow, it's going to be 98 cents a gallon? You would have, you would have said, you lying through your teeth. You'd have been right. <laughs> Praise the Lord for that. Amen. I agree on that. And it did drop. But it didn't drop in 24 hours. No, $3. It dropped little by little by little. But, but Elisha gave them a, a, a word that little stretched. We've been in this famine for this long <coughs> with no changes, with no hope, and with no help. And then all of a sudden, in 24 hours, everything's going to be back to normal. And then this is when the little right-hand man spoke up. You know that little guy that's always wanting to pick a fight, but he wants big brother to fight for him? You know that guy that... What you looking at, punk? Then he gets behind the big guy. I'm talking to you. <laughs> little right-hand man. Little sidekick. You know, he want, to, he want to be bad as Batman, but he dressed like Robin. <laughs> he can't do it. He's standing back there, and he goes, yeah, maybe if God would open up, put windows in heaven and open up, maybe this would be so, would it? And Elisha said, little boy, Look, I, I tell it like I like to tell it. It's modern day. It's 2020. We don't talk with the dust and dials and God. I like to say, Elisha said, little boy, you're going to see it. But because of your smart little mouth, you ain't going to eat it. You're going to see it, but you won't get any of it. Watch it. Watch it. I believe Elisha would have been a good daddy, amen, in this time. He'd have put a blister on. He'd have, he'd have broke a switch off in a heartbeat. The Lord sent his prophet the word of hope and deliverance. Our cities today need a a word of hope and deliverance. Our people today need a word of hope and deliverance. And I'm not talking about a word that says you're going to get a check in the mail. I'm not talking about a word that says, oh, God's just going (coughs) to give you a, a, a journey through the flower bed. We need folks that know how to deliver the truth that says, yes, there's going to be valleys. There's going to be shadows of death. There's going to be Goliaths. There's going to be lion's dens. There's going to be... 
captivity moments. There's going to be places, but there's always a but God in any of those situations. We need some prophets that'll come in and say, God's going to bring a famine. God's going to bring, he's going to shut up the heavens, but I'm here to tell you that when I pray, he's going to open them back up. Amen. We need some folks that'll go in there and say, let my people go and bring the locusts, but the Israelites be okay. Bring the, bring the boils, but the Israelites be okay. Bring the frogs, but the Israelites be okay. Just keep letting them pour it out and say, look, yeah, you're going to see some bad things, but you got a good God that's going to make good out of what you go through. Amen? I'm trying to close it up here. Our cities today need this hope of deliverance. We need preachers and prophets. We need witnesses and those who are willing to testify to the truth, not some made-up theology, not some made-up feel-good message, not some made-up, well, if you dance three times, twinkle your toes, clip your heels three times together and say, I want to go home, you'll get over the rainbow. Uh, we don't need sermons that's going to rain skittles. We need sermon that's going to give us fire and power and authority to rise up and to know that though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. Yea, they set themselves against me. I will not be afraid for thou art my shield and the lifter of my head. Though I walk, though I'm here in this midst of valley, though I'm in this lion's den, I will pray and believe that in the morning time I'm going to walk out the same way I came in. I know that if I walk into the river, I will not the floods will not overtake me and though I enter the fire I will not be burned and neither shall the flame kindle upon me though I step into the Red Sea I still got a devil but the, everything went in the sea but only God's chosen came out amen you got to be willing to walk through the places God takes you believing God's got a purpose and a destiny that whatever's behind you is trying to interrupt there is a there is a, a, a thing on the trucks that we had in Afghanistan because People were setting off IEDs with cell phones. We had a thing called a Duke system. And it stayed off the front of the truck. And when you're driving, it would interrupt cell phone signal. I had a little Nokia cell phone. Y'all remember a little Nokia cell phone? Had the coolest game in the world, Snake on it. That's what I had when I was in Afghanistan. And it only cost me $970,000 to call home one time. So, I, but I had that cell phone because my dad was actually deployed to Afghanistan at the same time. And we could make in-country calls pretty cheap. So I carried that cell phone. But I remember every time I'd get in that gunner's hatch during those missions and that Duke system was rolling, I'd pull up my, my cell phone and there was no service. There was nothing there. And there's things in your life that have come to block your signal. They have come to interrupt your relationship with God. They have come to knock you off your course. But I'm here to tell you today, if you will stay the course, if you will fight the good fight, if you will stay, you got to be like David someday. you got to convince yourself and encourage yourself. Is there not a cause? i got to stand up. This, this uncircumcised Philistine will not stay out here running his mouth. There's got to be a cause for us to fight this man. We can't let him keep trampling our name. <coughs> we need people that are testified to the truth. And I wanted to come by this morning to ask you here, are there any Elijahs in the house who will ask the question, how long do you stumble between two opinions? If Baal be God, then worship him. But if the Lord be God, then worship him. I want to know this morning, are there any Elishas in the house, amen, who would deliver a message of hope to those who are hopeless, deliver a message of life to those that are dead? Are there any Isaiahs who will raise up their hand when God says, whom shall I send and say, send me, Lord, I'll go. How would you respond if famine hit your house? How would you respond? Put yourself in the position of these four leprous men and everybody else. How would you respond if the famine hit your house? It's, it's, it's pretty easy to read these stories like a fairy tale when you can pay your bills, when everything's going good in your life, when you are high on the horse. But what if famine hit your house and everything you had in a moment was lost? What if everything that you put your hands to for all your life, a plow, all of a sudden quit producing? What if, what if the word that you've been preaching for so long all of a sudden felt dead to you? What if, what if the, 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 the family, the, 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 the brother you always used to rely on quit being your brother? What if the sister you always used to call on decided she didn't need you anymore? What if the children that you raised up and hoped would always be there turned their backs and left you? What if famine hit your house? What would you do? Will you choose to just accept your fate as the world said you must? Or will you lean on God and refuse to die in a poverty situation? 
These four men said, are we going to sit here? Are we really just going to sit here and die? It's bad enough that we're lepers. It's bad enough that we got to deal with what's on our skin right now. But are we really going to just sit here and, and die in it? Are we really just going to leave the legacy of a bunch of quitters? Are we really just going to leave the idea that when folks come by and see us on the street, we're not going to look any different than dung? No. They wanted something different. Will you give up or will you fight? The fight won't be an easy one. The key is you can't give up in the fight. The fight might beat you down a little, and it may, it may feel like you've lost in that round, but do you know that in a boxing match, it isn't the man that gets knocked down that loses. It's the man that gets locked down and doesn't get back up. You're going to get knocked down. Ryan just seen it. I read his lips. There's an old song. I get knocked down, but I get up again. You're never going to keep me down. I get knocked down, but I get up again. You ought to make that your anthem. Yeah, I get knocked down. Because what's going to happen is when you start telling folks I'm a Christian, guess what they're going to do? They're going to expect you to never fall. And when you fall, they're going to crucify you. Boy, they're going to put you on that tree faster than they did Jesus. They ain't even going to take you to the... They ain't going to take you to try. They're just going to put you on the tree immediately. And they're going to put you on, they're going to whip you while you're on the cross. But the good news is, Jesus never said, you got to be perfect before. God didn't say, you got to be holiness before you can be mine. He said, come and be mine and I'll make holiness out of you. See, there wasn't nothing special about that ground on the backside of the desert Moses went to. It was the fact God showed up and then it became holy ground. Amen. When God shows up in your life, he's going to begin to move some things and change some things and give you truth and revelation, but you've got to be willing to search it out. I can have my musicians go ahead and get ready to come up. I know y'all, y'all thinking, man, it ain't even but, but, but 12 o'clock and you still got two hours to preach. I'm just playing. You've got you to be willing to let the bell ring and one around and say, okay, you got me. You got me. You caught me off guard with that one, devil. Right. You know, hey, it's all right. You caught me off guard. It's going to happen. You know, you got Dave. You caught David off guard. You caught, you caught Peter off guard. You caught Paul off guard. But those are some of the greatest names we read in the Bible because they, they got back up. Right. And they went another round. You caught one on the chin. Last night. The stat said, I don't know how many of you call a UFC, but last night, I don't know, you know Conor McGregor? He's a little lucky charm man on UFC. He was coming back for his fight after he lost a horrendous fight last year. This was his first fight back, and, and, and he was fighting a man by, by the name of Cowboy. And Cowboy's numbers looked like McGregor was probably going to get it handed to him. In 40 seconds, when they clinched up, McGregor used his shoulder and was hitting him in the clinch and broke his nose, which limited any more, any more excitement or any more drive that Cowboy had from that point forward. And in 40 seconds into that probably $100 million fight, in 40 seconds, millions of people all over the world spent $70 to watch it. In 40 seconds, Conor McGregor threw a foot in the air and put him on his back and ended the fight. What I'm trying to tell you is, people, there's going to be some people who's going to set the odds against you. Oh, you was an addict for way too long. You'll never come back. Oh, you was broken for far too long. Oh, you've been abused. Oh, you were raped. Oh, you were, you were abandoned. Oh, you were oh, put up for adoption. You were raised in foster care. You've been poor. You've been broke. Oh, you, you went to prison. They're going to put all these odds against you. But I just wish you'd come out there and just put your shoulder in the nose of everything that said you will never make it. And put a foot to the devil's chin when you stand up and become who God said you are. Sometimes suffering comes, but I'm here to tell you this morning, it don't last. The Bible says weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Amen. Romans chapter 8 verse 18 says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. He says the things that I go through are nothing compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in us when Christ comes. I serve a God 
who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think. He is able to take your molehill and make a mountain. He is able to take your ashes and make beauty. He is able to take your dirty soul and make diamonds. He is able to take your mess, put it in the fire, and bring out gold. He is able to take you through things that will purify you. But you got to get back up and you got to get in a fight. And you gotta, you got to go out here saying, I refuse to die right here. You might not die in the physical realm. You may not die by you quit breathing and your heart quits beating. But do you know how many people that were so strong in the faith that today, because of struggles and hard times and anger and bitterness and some of that leprosy that they never took care of, they let it live in them and it just kept piling up on the outside. Before you know it, they ruin their reputation, they blemish their character, and nobody trusted them, and because nobody trusted them, they, they just gave up thinking God could use them, and they died. They might be living, they might be eating and drinking every day like we are, but they're dead spiritually. <coughs> but can I tell you that when you die in Christ, there's a scripture used in many different contexts but it says the dead in Christ shall be raised first can I tell you Lazarus died and Christ started a good thing he's wanting you to get up he's wanting you to say I refuse to die right here and if you feel like you've already died let him resurrect you let him bring that resurrection power into your life You had the king of Syria who came in and besieged this place. They surrounded the walls. They wouldn't allow food to come in. They were forced to use everything they had. They got so low until they were eating the head of a donkey, the dung of a dove, and they went so far as cannibalism. The reason for this famine was so that Syria could starve out and weaken the inhabitants of the city, leaving them defenseless when their army came in to overtake their city. Have you ever asked God, why do I go, why do I fall under attacks? Why is it even, because the enemy knows that if he can attack you, and you don't know how to get help in the middle of your situation, he's going to weaken you. And the more he can weaken you, the more he can break you down, the more he's going to inflict upon you. But when you rise up, and you say, I refuse to die right here. I'm going to go to the Syrian camp. Those four leprous men, they started walking. They, they started moving in. They started saying, I'm refused to die right here. They started walking. I'm just going. They didn't went. They didn't, the only option, imagine being in Jews, the only option they had was to turn to their enemy for help. You in some bad places when you got to turn to your enemy for help. They start walking to the enemy's camp. The only hope they have is that they'll accept them as slaves and use them and feed them. But the Bible says that they start walking up there, and it never says that the leprous men were ever aware of this. And I believe that they never heard it because they were surprised when they got there. But the Bible says that the Lord made the Syrians hear the sound of a heavenly host of, of kings. Hey, the, the Syrians begin to say, the king of Israel has hired the king of Hittites and the, and the king of the Egyptians and they've hired them on. They're coming to attack us. We've got to go. We've got to flee. And the only thing on the other side of that wall, listen to this, was four leprous men. Four leprous men walking in God was sounding like royalty. Their steps in their own mind was nothing, but in the minds of their enemy, they sounded like an army. The praise of one person that has been broken, it don't sound like nothing to you, but to God, it sound like an army and they were walking in they were pressing in they were pushing in they said I refuse to die right here I gotta go somewhere I gotta get somewhere and on their way they didn't know what they were gonna find when they got there but they're on their way and God said watch this these kings these these soldiers of Syria were sitting around they were 
eating and drinking and being merry, and they were wearing their little armor, and they had their chariots tied up, and they had their war horses tied up. They had their donkeys tied up that would carry their burdens. They had gold and silver in the tents. Four leprous men come walking towards the gate. And all of a sudden, they begin to hear the rumble. They just, get, get, just give me a little bit of drum. They just begin to hear a rumble. Just a, the, the, the marching, the marching of, of saints, the marching of a heavenly host. And in other words, they quit hearing what was on the outside the gate. And they started hearing God's purpose on the way. And because they wasn't in God's purpose, they had to move out of the way. I'm here to tell you this morning, there's some things that are in your way right now. But if you'll just keep walking, God's going to move those things out of your way. But you got to be willing to step. you got to be willing to step. you got to be willing to step and get right to where God wants you to be. Don't worry. Don't entertain the devil. Don't entertain his thoughts. Don't entertain. Don't act out. Just let God carry you one step at a time. And the marching of the saints is going to be going. Oh, there's going to be a sound. There's going to be a breakthrough. It's just going to be loud, 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 right, loud. And then the chariots and the wheels are going to begin to sound. And your devil is going to start running and fleeing. Will you stand to your feet all over the house this morning? Brother Josh, I'm at the highlight of my life right now. I'm not going through anything. Let me tell you something. You might not be going through something, but I bet you there's a neighbor on one of your left or on your right that is. Maybe, Maybe you don't know who they are, but let me tell you, if you don't know nothing else, know this. The church is full of leprosy. And it needs to be cleansed. And it needs to be made whole. But folks, the reason folks are staying in it is because they felt guilty. They feel like if I step out, folks are going to judge me. And you're right. They probably will. But let me tell you something. Let them judge you because they ain't your judge. They won't, you, they won't stand before a single person in this room on the day of judgment. But you've got a reason to march this morning. You've got a reason to step to the gate this morning. You are living in a nation that has taken the word of God and mocked it and made it a mockery in our schools uh, and trying to tell our children that, that, that science is the only way, that knowledge is the only way. But I'm here to tell you, without the wisdom of God, your knowledge is trash. If you don't have the wisdom of God, your knowledge is useless. If you don't have the wisdom of God, you can't get the revelation of God. Wisdom and knowledge work together, and you can't have one without the other. Or it becomes a weapon of destruction instead of a weapon that will help build the kingdom. Why should I go in this march? Your children are going to school every day. They're not allowed to say a prayer in the, ch- in the school, but they can go to the nurse and get a condom. You need to start marching. Amen. Your schools are telling your kids. Your, you got folks in your, trying, to, trying to tell your kids what it means. How to, how to do things that they shouldn't be doing. How to be in places they shouldn't be going. You've got, I drove a school bus for a year. So I'm going to tell you, we got some here right now that are witnessing too. you got folks, you got folks in leadership at the schools. You write a child up and they laugh it off with the kid that got in trouble. You're living in a, in a nation that is divided. You're living in a nation that is separated itself. You're living in a, in a church culture that doesn't know revelation from lying in the sea. You're living in a place where folks don't look at the word for answers anymore. They want to know what feels good, what sounds good, what smells good. But I'm here to tell you today, you might be in a broken place. You might be in a moment of leprosy. But if you will say, I refuse to die right here, you don't have to accept what the devil's done. You don't have to accept what the devil said. Just start walking in your promise. Start walking in who you are. So this is what I want to do this morning. The second half of the sermon next Sunday, I'll go ahead and tell you what the title is. The title of next week's sermon is It Ain't Right to Tell Somebody. See, what happens is when you march and you know that I didn't those leprous men had nothing to do with, the, with an entire Syrian army fleeing. All they did was walk. All they did was walk. They just said, I'm not going to die here. If I die, I'm going to die trying. If I'm going to die, I'm at least going to die knowing I gave everything I had to do. I, I, I exhausted all my options. 
And then they will walk into the enemy's camp. And the Lord sent a heavenly host. A sound of a heavenly host. And they flee. And when they got on the inside, those hungry stomachs got food. Those thirsty souls got drink. Oh, they got so much, they started hiding. See, when you first come to God and you first get out your situation, you're going to be trying to harbor extra blessing. You're going to be out there, man, they're going to be coming from heaven. You're going to say, I'm going to take me home with some midnight snack. You're going to try to get as much you can hide it. But then God's going to say, hold up a minute. You need to tell somebody what I've done for you. You better go tell somebody how I delivered you. You go tell somebody how my blood set you free. Go tell somebody how you were broken and disgusted. You were busted and disgusted. You were, you were beat up from the feet up. You were messed up from the chest up. Hey Amen. You were torn up from the floor up. But God brought out of you righteousness. He brought out of you holiness. And through you, your dirtiness and your filth, God made you pure and holy. You better go tell somebody. But before you can tell somebody, before you get your testimony, you got to get your victory. You got to get your victory this morning. So what I want to ask you to do this morning, I'm going to ask my wife, if you were, on, if you were here at the women's conference and you were on the prayer team, I'm going to ask you to come help. And if you need prayer, you get your prayer first. But when you're done, I want to ask you to help pray. Even if you, don't, even if you just have to get behind somebody and pray from a distance, I want you to help pray. And this is what I want to ask this morning from the people. If you're here and you're ready to start walking, you're saying, I refuse to die right here. I've been weak. I've been absent. I've been absent from my duties. I've been absent from my church. I've been absent from my ministry. I've been absent from my calling. But I refuse to die right here. I've been going through some things, and I'm struggling with some things right now, but I refuse to die right here. I, I, I'm going through some personal things, some issues in my mind. I'm, I'm going through some bitterness, some suicidal thoughts, and I refuse to die right here. Amen. If, if there's anything on your table that you're ready to get off and just throw off the table and make a clean slate and say, Lord, bless me in the presence of my enemies. Anoint my head with oil. Let my cup overflow and surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. If you're here this morning, I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you this morning. So uh, do y'all have something ready to go? They're going to begin to praise. I'm going to turn my microphone off. And if you need prayer this morning, this is your chance. Step into it. I refuse to die right here. I refuse to die in this place. I refuse to die in this moment. I refuse to give up. I refuse to say, it'll never, I'll never get it back. I refuse to say, I'll never find my kids. I refuse to say, I'll never be restored to my parents. I refuse to say, that what's been broken can't be healed. I refuse to say it. I refuse to die. That's you this morning. These altars are open. We're here to pray. my faith a little higher, set my spirit on.